Hey everybody, welcome back once again to Science in 10. We've made it to the last portion of the rock cycle, metamorphism and metamorphic rocks. These rocks are the products of intense heat, pressure, or combinations thereof present within the Earth's crust. Metamorphic rocks are incredibly important because they are essentially recorders of the conditions within the Earth's crust where these rocks form. They're also really pretty. Ooh, shiny. Whoa, garnets. Metamorphic rocks get their name from the term metamorphosis, which literally means to change. However, I should point out that the change in a rock that occurs during the metamorphic process involves a mineralogical change, but generally not a chemical change. This means that during metamorphism, the mineral composition of the rock will change, but the elements that the minerals and the rock are made of will not. The exception, of course, is if there is an introduction or removal of elements by superheated water, but that is its own special type of metamorphism. So, what sorts of processes can change a pre-existing rock, also known as a protolith, into something new? It turns out that metamorphic processes are one or a combination of three main factors, subjecting a rock to great pressures, subjecting a rock to high temperatures, but not high enough to completely melt the rock, or exposing the rock to superheated fluids within the crust. Let's take a closer look at these metamorphic processes. First up, pressure. With respect to metamorphism, pressure also known as stress in geologic terms, comes in two main varieties within the crust. One variety is lithostatic stress, stress applied evenly from all directions. Imagine how your head feels when you're at the bottom of a swimming pool, being compressed from all directions. Or a more extreme example, a styrofoam model taken to great depths within the ocean. The even application of stress produces an even change in the size of an object. Things will get smaller. If you start with a cube, you will finish with a cube, but the cube will be much, much smaller in size. The other is differential stress, stress applied greater in one direction than the others, which will produce a change in shape of an object. In order to subject a rock to stresses great enough to cause metamorphism, one or a combination of two things needs to happen. First, the rock could be buried deep within a sedimentary basin, and the weight of the overlying rocks will compress the deeper ones. This is known as burial metamorphism, and is a result of lithostatic stress. Second, a rock could be caught up in a convergent tectonic boundary and subject to intense differential stress. This is known as regional or tectonic metamorphism. In addition to stress, intense heat can cause a rock to metamorphose. Generally, this heat will come from an igneous intrusion, essentially cooking the country rock that the melt is intruding into. This is known as contact metamorphism. Of course, if we bury a rock deep enough at a convergent tectonic boundary, it will also be subject to enough heat to metamorphose, but we'll come back to this combination later. Another way to metamorphose a rock is by adding or removing ions or minerals via hydrothermal processes, dissolving or precipitating minerals using superheated water. This is hydrothermal metamorphism and is common at mid-ocean ridges and surrounding igneous intrusions where lots of water is present within the crust. Now that we have an idea of metamorphic processes, let's take a look at the products of metamorphism. Metamorphic rocks. Similar to igneous and sedimentary rocks, we classify metamorphic rocks based on their texture. We can define metamorphic texture in general as the alignment of minerals in a rock or the lack thereof. This gives us two categories of metamorphic rocks. Rocks that have an alignment of minerals, also known as foliation and foliated metamorphic rocks, and rocks that do not. Foliated metamorphic rocks develop an alignment of platy micaceous minerals or a banding of minerals by composition during the metamorphic process. In order for foliation to form, a protolith must be subject to differential stress. Foliated metamorphic rocks are generally products of regional or tectonic metamorphism. Non-foliated metamorphic rocks simply don't have an alignment of platy minerals. These rocks are generally massive or crystalline, having undergone a change to the mineral structure within the rock without developing any sort of alignment of mineral grains. Classification and naming of metamorphic rocks is based on their texture and mineral composition. Foliated rocks are named based on the degree of metamorphism the rock has experienced. In other words, 
how intense is the development of foliation within the rock. Let's take a look at foliated metamorphic rocks working from low grade or not much metamorphism to high grade or really intense metamorphism. A slaty texture is typical of a low grade metamorphic rock and defined by the parallel orientation of microscopic platy minerals. Rocks with a slaty texture are creatively named slate. Protoliths of slate include mudstone, shale, siltstone, other fine-grained sedimentary rocks, or ash. Slate can sometimes look like its protolith shale, but the slate will have a bit more of a sheen and a tink sound when lightly struck with a hammer. Next up, in a slightly higher degree of metamorphism, are rocks with a phyllitic texture. These rocks are named phyllites and generally have a well-defined sheen and are often crenulated or have a wavy foliation. This sheen comes from the growth of micaceous minerals, though the individual grains are still microscopic. Protoliths of phyllite are the same as those for a slate, and also includes slate. Once a rock has undergone enough metamorphism so that the growth of mica minerals have become macroscopic, the rock now has a schistose texture. This rock is named a schist and is easily identified by visible grains of micaceous minerals such as biotite, muscovite, or chlorite. And again, protoliths of a schist can include all those for phyllite and phyllite. The higher grade metamorphic rocks are not defined by an alignment of platy minerals, but by compositional banding of light and dark colored minerals, or by felsic and mafic minerals. This is a gneissic texture, and as you might guess, the rock is named a gneiss. Protoliths of gneiss include all the foliated rocks we've described up through now, plus granites and other intrusive igneous rocks. Specific names for foliated metamorphic rocks can be modified based on what minerals are present within the rock. For example, a garnet mica schist, an amphibolite gneiss, green schist if the schist contains chlorite or other green minerals, blue schist if the schist contains bluish minerals such as glaucophane, serpentinite if the rock has a schistose texture but lots of serpentine or talc present, these often form from mafic rocks subject to regional metamorphism at subduction zones. And migmatite if the rock has a gneissic texture, but the rock was subject to enough heat so that the felsic minerals melted and recrystallized during the metamorphic process. Non-foliated metamorphic rocks are classified primarily by mineral content, which is a direct result of what the protolith was. A quartzite is recrystallized quartz sandstone and can be a product of burial metamorphism. Marble is recrystallized calcite from limestone or dolostone. Greenstone is metamorphosed basalt or other mafic igneous rocks, where olivine that was present in the protolith has been altered to epidote or chlorite. Eclogite is an incredibly dense mafic metamorphic rock, composed mainly of pyroxene and garnet. Basalt or other mafic igneous rocks are its protolith, and in order for eclogite to form, these protoliths need to be subject to extreme pressures generally at the base of the crust in a subduction zone. Other non-foliated metamorphic rocks include hornfels, a product of contact metamorphism, and scarn, crystalline product of hydrothermal metamorphism when an igneous intrusion invades clastic or carbonaceous sedimentary rocks. So, what can metamorphic rocks really tell us? It turns out that the type of foliation, or lack thereof, and the minerals present in a metamorphic rock record the conditions within the Earth's crust where the rock formed. Here's a graph where we will lay out various metamorphic facies, or specific sets of mineral and textural assemblages in a metamorphic rock that form at different temperature and pressure conditions within the Earth's crust. The vertical axis represents approximate depths and pressures within the Earth's crust. The deeper you go, the greater the pressure. The horizontal axis is temperature in degrees Celsius. We can overlay an average geotherm on the graph, or a line showing the temperature of Earth's interior as depth increases. This first geotherm is typical of a continent-continent collision, and the second is typical of a cooler subduction zone. Next, let's add on various metamorphic facies to illustrate the pressure and temperature conditions where these rocks form. Hornfels, being formed by contact metamorphism, is a low-pressure, high-temperature rock. The progression from sedimentary rocks to slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss roughly follows the typical geothermal gradient found at a continent-continent collision. Green schist facies rocks are phyllites and schists that form under medium temperature and medium pressure conditions. Amphibolite facies require either high temperature, high pressure, or both. And blue schist and eclogite facies are typical of metamorphism found at a subduction zone. And one more thing to add to the graph. 
This final line shows the melting point of wet or hydrous rocks with a granitic composition. At temperatures or pressures greater than this line, these rocks will melt. At first, this will form a migmatite, if only the felsic minerals melt and recrystallize. But if we keep increasing the temperature, we've gone to a full melt and have to go back to thinking about igneous rocks and igneous processes. So there we have it, our full tour through the rock cycle. But rocks can tell us so much more than just how they formed. Stay tuned for future videos.